Today we take it for granted that we can enjoy our freedoms in a large republic. But in the late 1700s, there was a strong feeling that a republican government could not be sustained over a large and diverse country. As the Articles of Confederation were proving to be ineffective, and the country was looking for an alternative, a debate raged in the states concerning whether they should adopt the Constitution. Many feared the Constitution would either be ineffective, as the Articles of Confederation was, or, more realistically, the Constitution would concentrate too much power in a federal government and revert the states back into a system of tyranny. To urge the people to ratify the new proposed Constitution, Alexander Hamilton began to write anonymous letters to the people of New York and recruited James Madison and John Jay to assist him on this project. Between 1787 and 1788, 85 of these letters were published in newspapers in New York City, urging New Yorkers to ratify the Constitution. These letters were all anonymously signed with the name Publius, in homage of the original Publius who helped establish the Roman Republic. All the letters were later published in one complete book called The Federalist in 1788. The Federalist Papers are fundamental in two key aspects. They not only discuss the specific elements of the United States Constitution being proposed at the time, but they also broadly discuss political theory in a sophisticated and fascinating way. Reading the Federalist Papers helps us understand the Constitution and also forces us to grapple with a number of timeless and critical questions regarding the philosophy of law and government. Some articles are considered more important and relevant than others. To note a few key passages, Federalist 10 and Federalist 14 contain Madison's conception of a Republican representative form of government. In Federalist 10, Madison describes the inevitability of factions developing in society, advocating for their own self-interests. Madison writes how a Republican government can keep factions in check and how the United States is better suited to be a republic because it's too large to be a successful direct democracy. Federalist 39 contains additional details of Madison's conception of a republican form of government and also a design of federalism in which state and federal governments share power. Federalist 51, also authored by Madison, discusses the needs for checks and balances between branches of government in order to safeguard liberty and also discusses factions at the end. In Federalist 70, Hamilton presents arguments for a unitary executive. At the time, many Americans were weary of having one president, fearing that he would too closely resemble a king and be able to abuse power like a tyrant. Hamilton addresses these concerns and argues nevertheless for an executive branch composed of a single president as opposed to a panel of two or three equals sharing executive power, as some of his contemporaries preferred. In Federalist 68, Hamilton also famously describes and advocates for an electoral college to elect the president as opposed to a direct election by the people. In Federalist 78, Hamilton discusses judicial review, the legal doctrine that gives the judiciary, the court's final say over the constitutionality of laws passed by Congress. The Constitution itself does not mention this doctrine or specify which branch has the power to determine if laws are unconstitutional and invalidate them. Of particular interest are also ideas contained in the Federalist Papers that seem foreign to us today. In Federalist 84, Hamilton writes that there is no need to incorporate a Bill of Rights into the Constitution. At the time of these debates, the Constitution did not yet contain the Bill of Rights, the first ten amendments that list the individual liberties that the government may not unreasonably obstruct. Hamilton reasoned that it would be dangerous for the Constitution to enumerate a list of rights, as it would inevitably lead to the suppression of any rights not specifically listed. Eventually, as we know, the Constitution was amended to include the Bill of Rights. Similarly, Hamilton argues in Federalist 72 against limiting the number of terms a person may serve as president. The longer a person were to hold the office of president, Hamilton argued, the more stable the country would be. Limiting the terms a president could be elected could lead to 
quote, fatal inconveniences of fluctuating councils and a variable policy, end quote. As we know, after President Franklin D. Roosevelt served four terms as president, Congress passed the 22nd Amendment, limiting each president to a term limit of two elected terms. The Federalist Papers remain important to this day. Judges and policymakers rely upon and quote the papers in the course of judicial opinions and political discussion. For example, President George W. Bush's administration cited to Federalist 7 to defend the president's broad power in foreign policy and right to target terrorists without consent of Congress. It's not uncommon for candidates for political office to quote a Federalist paper on the campaign trail or even after assuming office. Supreme Court justices have cited Federalist 42 and 78 numerous times, often referencing these writings to determine the original meaning of the Constitution's language and spirit. One famous example, when Justice Souter, in his dissent in Prince v. U.S., wrote, quote, In deciding these cases, which I have found closer than anticipated, it is the Federalist that finally determines my position, end quote. The full text of the Federalist Papers is available from the Library of Congress.